Sanbunani, Jambo, Abarikani. Hope everyone is well and comfortable this evening. Today we're going to be talking about China and Africa, and we're going to be talking about the Chinese African relations and how that's going to affect us. And basically, what we're going to look at the social economic impact that the Chinese investment in Africa has caused. Um, to start off, I'm going to read a passage. It says, the role played by the Chinese government and companies in the socioeconomic impact China's activities in Africa are often characterized as evil when they are seen as representing China's selfish quest for natural resources and damaging Afri Africa's fragile efforts to improve go governance and build a sustainable future. However, they are characterized as virtuous when they are seen as contributing to a foundation for long-term economic development through infrastructure projects and revenue creation. And then for, in order for us to carry on and, and understand what this notion means, we have to understand that we're first going to look at how foreign direct investment in Africa was done before China came. So we're going to look at the World Bank and the IMF. So the World Bank and IMF came into Africa and they gave us um, uh, debt in exchange for change, basically. So what happened is they, they came in and changed our public policies and the public policies made us take... Um, it made us change our trade systems in accordance to what they wanted our public policies to be. So now what China says they're doing is that they, when they're giving us the loans in Africa, they're giving us loans that are conditional and are only, and only have monetary, mo monetary conditions. So they saying that they, their loans are only interested in monetary, they only have monetary interest in African relations and not, and no interest in changing our internal uh, relations such as our public policies and how our banking systems work, which is what the Western world has done. However, it's important for us to understand that in this situation of us accepting the Chinese loans, we, there, there has been an increase in the debts that most African countries have received. And now, our, and due to the fact that these loans are taken and are pegged against our natural resources, and we know that natural resources in Africa are important for things such as, uh, food security and many other things. We, the, the narrative for this discussion is how do we as African countries go about looking at these loans and how do we respond to them following questions that I have that I would like us to discuss for us to, to build the narrative about the loans and understand what China is doing in Africa. Uh, firstly, we have to look at loan transparency, look at loan reduction, loan suspension, and, and loan resolution. When you look at loan transparency, right, the, the main aim of loan transparency is we're looking at how do we deal with the transparency of when we, we as African countries, when we, when we receiving the loans, there are activists in each country that want to know what the, what the contracts of the, what, what, of what the contracts of these loans actually means. So how do we as Africans build a, a narrative where we can, where the activists in these multiple countries can say, we want to know everything in the state of affairs in the loans. So I don't know, I'm going to ask you, or I, do you want me, I'm going to ask you what you think we should do. Okay, on the activists who, who want to know, like, what's the situation of the loans. So for instance, I, I don't think that's very effective, if you ask me. I don't think it's very effective what activists in one single country are doing like trying to get the terms of the loans because other than giving the public information on what on what are the terms of the loans it doesn't change the situation of what terms china still keeps wanting for countries to sign on to because what the activists seem to think is that it's the governments of this country who intentionally go after signing bad terms for the loans. But what I wonder is, or what really my question is, is it because the governments of these countries intentionally want to sign bad terms for the loans? Or is it because the governments of this country really have no option but to sign on the terms of those loans? So I think the discussion about what activists are doing may slightly help because it will just expose any kind of fraud that there might be in the government decisions. It might expose that. 
but it doesn't help to make the terms of the contracts uh, better. I think that really can only come from understanding why it is that China is asking for these terms because the governments are signing on to the terms, but it's because they're signing on to the terms that China is asking them to sign on to. So the question is, is Africa, re- do, do they have the bargaining power not to sign on those terms? Or is it that they are pushed they're in between a rock and a hard place and those are the only terms they have to sign, you know. So really yeah. that's what I think. But so, I agree I agree if there is maybe activists throughout Africa that might help build a greater bargaining power. But yeah. I think more so for me the reason why that question is important is because the transparency part of it is that what we're trying to say is there there has to be too close understanding from from the people in in Africa. I, the same way we can know about common news on the on like the media that we see every day, we should be able to have a Bloomberg in, in Africa that and that and a Bloomberg that's strictly actually focused on these China Africa relations. Because when we're passing legislations, we know that there's white paper and all that stuff. So it's always great to have the communities active in things that are going to help them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and that, and, and in us raising the awareness and saying, no, the communities, it's, it's not about, I don't know. I think the word activist makes it sound like we're saying we want people to go against the narrative, but it's, it should be just to build awareness. So then that people actually understand that in this situation, that what's happening right now, our presidents are going to do this, 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 and that. And then from the parent, but from that, the people are given the ability to say, no, we don't like this. We don't like that. We like this. We want this from this. We want that from that. And that just builds an, an understanding of more sovereignty. And then the question of, uh, I think you asked the question was, are the presidents given, are they in a rock, uh, between a rock and a hot place? I don't know how the saying is, but that thing is, it's, it's the whole idea of like what, why the abstract that I, I took from it's, it's a double edged sword because we understand that in order for Africa to move forward at this stage that we are at now, we have to go look at how did China, such a big country, right, in itself, that has mm-hmm. way more people than most countries, and, then, and it was also divided. How did they come together and, and, and go to such a big economic superpower? Because I know that we don't want to follow their social, their social plans because I feel like it's very restrictive. Because we know from what we've learned, like the censorship and all that stuff. Like, I don't think we want that to people in general. But the economic upliftment is what we can look at. So, if we look at the fact that in China, the, the, the development came from, they sort of offered manufacturing. So, when we look at the idea of manufacturing as, as a base for African countries, we know that we have high poverty rates, right? So, when we have high poverty, we want to, we want to create the, the easiest jobs and the easiest jobs that we can create for a lot of people at the time is we're going to look at like manufacturing jobs. And then what the manufacturing idea does for us is we go beyond just creating the jobs. We start creating the idea that no, us as Africans can now start building made in Africa or Africa by design. And that becomes a brand for us as Africans because now we have the, the manufacturing capacity. And then from having that, um, Africa by design, um, brand from there we move on forward and we say okay cool now that that's happened we we encouraging africans on, in africa yeah so <laughs> now that's why the transparency is so important because when you get the because everything has to grow from the, the crossroad so transparency says to every every individual who can watch the news or every individual who's interested in knowing what's happening and knowing that there are jobs that the chinese are going to give us or is the, the, the loans that are coming on this, 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 and they're going here. It's great because it also gives the, what the government accountability. So the government now is, is given the full accountability to disclose every deal that they do. So there's no more African citizens finding out like five years later that, Hey, we actually signed a deal five years ago that put us $180 billion in debt. That's that, that's what I feel transparency is so important. And, and mainly that I'm not because the the tough thing for us to understand right now is Africa is in a position where China is here. We've signed the deal, right? Yeah. Everything's happened. So now it's like 
let's get it way more transparent than what we have done with the World Bank and the IMF because what they did to us has set us back so many years. I mean, they have us importing food from other countries that we know we don't need. So it's like, we don't want those same mistakes anymore. So in order for us to build more sovereignty and, and, and for African people to get more engaged in the African economic system, we need to build a system where even a person, I hate to use the term, average and, 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 and isn't engaged knows that what's happening between Africa and China. I agree with what you're saying because I think there is actually, I think even what the activists are asking for is information which a person in, in like, for instance, a person in Kenya, it's information you don't know because you're like, how is it that the Chinese have set base at the airport in, in Kenya building it? So, but we don't, because we, we have no information on the loans and any information on any terms that the government has signed. It leads to more public suspicion, public outcry, public. So I agree with what you're saying because there's a lot of lack of information and with lack of information comes speculation. So you start speculating on, oh, is it that the government did this or is it this what's happening? But if everything was laid out on the table, then I agree that it might help, you know, like every person knows really these are the times we are dealing with, you know, like, so you understand what's going on. Yeah. Because I believe, I believe the, the pillars for investment that Africa should lean on going forward for foreign direct investment in Africa are accountability, transparency, and merit-based. We, we need a merit-based system because I'm saying this, like, once again, the, the Chinese model of, uh, of economics, the, the merit-based system removes our corruption because we've known throughout so many years that we've had corrupt leadership. So what we're saying is now we want full transparency because we as the people put you guys there. And we're tired of not having you guys be full, fully accountable. So it's, it's like a system of its, it's like its own system of checks and balances that actually makes the leaders even more accountable because they, we, we as the people who they are neglecting when they sign these deals because most of the money goes to them privately. We want to, we, we are saying to them, no, no, it's our time now. Can we please, can we please see the papers? Can we see everything? Can we understand why did you sign this, Bob? Where did this go, Jill? What's going on? What's the system? So, and then from there, it gets, it, it removes the, the, the mindset that, oh, our leaders are, are, are misleading us. So our leaders are doing this to us because once you build a, a narrative of transparency, the leaders are also on, it, it, it's hot, you know, like they're shaking in their, in their boots. <laughs> they're shaking. So it's like, a, if they so when we make them accountable by letting us be people who who know everything that they do, it's it's more interesting for us going forward because then the African people are, are being put forward as as a point of interest every time we make decisions that come to Chinese and African relations. You know, something interesting that you've said is that which I which I'm not sure because it sounds like governments through Africa are the same. It's almost like we come from the same source, like whether it's Nigeria to Ghana to Liberia. There's, there's something that goes on where it almost sounds like the people in, in government will, will sign a deal so that they can get some benefit out of it. Like there's a true lack of accountability for leaders in Africa. It's almost as if there's a training on how not to be accountable because it's a common narrative. I'm not sure where they learn from, but the situation of Kenya in, in about China and the terms, you mm -hmm. can copy that and it will be the exact same situation in Tanzania, the exact same situation in Congo and everywhere. It's almost as if we have the same school where all governments in Africa go to get trained on how to have state capture. <laughs> It's like, they, they do it so nicely, you know? They're so excellent as not being accountable. It's crazy. I think my response to that is that as much as I hate to say, it, 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 okay, it's their fault. Let's, let's leave it there, right? It, it's, it's their fault. But yeah. it's no deeper than that. Okay, before I get to my full point, it's their fault because at first what they do is they don't inform us fully about 
all the decisions. So when it comes out, then we get angry and be like, yo, state capture. So that's why, once again, transparency. But another thing is, we also, ourselves as people, have to blame ourselves for being misinformed and not wanting to engage in the topics and in the things that are happening in, in, in Africa. Because because what happens is later, they'll, they will say, oh, all of this information was out there. You just didn't go look. But then the topic, the, the other, the counter argument can be, yeah, but you guys didn't make the information more public. You publicize other things, but you don't publicize the important things that we need to see. So it's like, it's it's finding the fine line between those two things where where the public have to understand that we need to start informing ourselves more about what the government is doing. So when they do something, we can stop them immediately. Think of it as a as a parent. You want to watch your child because the government are our children. Every time they're gonna go try to do something, we must be like, mm -mm, don't do that, and hit them on the hand, you know. So it's like, but. If they're going to go do things behind closed doors and we don't see, then later they come back and say, oh, I did this. It's like, who are you going to blame? Are you going to blame yourself for not having been behind the closed door? Or do you blame the child for running away to do it? So, you know what I'm saying? But like, you just have to, we just have to learn to be more vigilant. But the, that also starts at them being more transparent is what I, is what I think. It, it's, we have to force them to be more transparent with the dealings. And I agree also in the first, the first statement you made about like being, having a strong, almost African activism, because the situation is common throughout most of the African countries. There's lack of accountability and, and they'll publicize information that is irrelevant. But what's relevant? You only hear about it when there's an, when there's, I don't know, when there's an investigation or something going on. That's when you'll find that that was, a, a website that was created about China, <laughs> China Kenya relations that will only come on the day when there's, there's a probe on like a scandal that, that happened five years ago. That's when you realize, Oh wow. So you had someone where you published this information, but no one ever knew about it. No one knows anything that you, you people do, but yeah. So I agree. Maybe this, this, I like, yeah. Yeah, so, so so that's why, like my friend and I were saying, when we're having this discussion, we're saying it would be so much easier since this China Africa relationship is going to be so big for so long. It'd be so much easier for us to actually have it for it to have its own um like portal. So we know that we can go on the internet. Each country will have its own portal, so you, and then you can go into let's say South Africa. I'll go. And it will update me to the latest China-Africa relation discussion that's happening now, regardless of when it is, you know, and then, and, and it should have a track list of all of that information so we can go as far back as the first one. So we can, cause now all the information is being put on a public path. And then now both the government can say, they can say, no, we gave you all the information you guys want. And then we, the people can also say, yeah, you guys are right. You guys, you guys did give us. So now it's like when we complain, it's because we were lazy and, and, and not because our children, which are the, the government, are, are not hiding information from us. So if we have an Africa-China website where we're looking at everything, so if I'm here and I know what's happening in Nigeria, I can go to the Nigeria tab, read everything about the Nigerian news or the Nigerian public policies of sign this, this is what the loans are. The loan tally is this much in Nigeria. We know that, okay, it's up to 180 billion. And in South Africa, we have 80 billion. Zimbabwe has uh, 200 billion or whatever it is. You know, all the, so now we know where we actually are and how it stands fully. Also, we should do this for the World Bank and the IMF too, but that's, we here for that. <laughs> and then uh, the next question is loan reduction. Okay. Um, so I said loan reduction is the Chinese loans have led to a serious debt trap among many African countries. What would the best way forward be to reduce our, or to reduce the loans or to renegotiate the loans? Huh. Mm. <laughs> Actually, to, to read, but how do you reduce them? Because if we say reduce the loans, it means that Okay, so, so here is what I think, because this loan, this loan is not, is not a donation. It's not, it's a loan. Like we need, it needs to be paid back. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not that we can go to China and tell them, write, 
write it off for us. Like we really are struggling, write it off for us. I mean, there was an agenda when the loan was given. The agenda is that I'm giving you money and China is going to get something out of it, whether it's interest. But in most cases, I don't think it's interest uh, that they, they look for. Well, there's interest, but there's, there's an agenda behind it. Like they're just not giving loans. If it's like the, the Belt and Road Initiative, it's that you're getting a loan so that maybe the, the airport is constructed, but it's because there's a Belt and Road Initiative that China is looking to establish, you know. So when you say reduce the loan, that doesn't, that can mean to write off the loan. It, it, it means that Africa, like if it's, if it's like, um, Ghana, if it has a loan, Ghana needs to pay back the loan to reduce it. But the question is, can Ghana really, like, if it's, it's a debt trap, the very point of a debt trap is that you can't get out of it. So, so, so reducing it may not be a quick option. I think so. But maybe renegotiating it might help. I think, there could be a case for renegotiating it when the terms look so bad and everyone actually stands up and tells China, surely, like, what, what kinds of terms are these that you've signed? But you see, the argument that they will have is that just like any, any other contract that you'd have with a bank, for instance, they will tell you that you knew what you're signing on to. So my question then would be, what's the leverage? that you'd be having as Africa going to say, let's renegotiate the terms. What, what, why? I mean, what would be the reason even for us to so, ask for that? I remember we had a discussion last year in the class. Remember when we were looking at that, some of the some of the loans come with deals, right? And then these deals will have the Chinese running the companies. and Because now if we can't, if they're saying, okay, you can't reduce the money, okay, let's renegotiate who you guys are going to hire in these in, in these companies. The ones who are going to build, like what you said in Kenya and in Ghana, this and this happened. So, because if they're building these infrastructures or they're building these systems, and the, the train company, we we're going to say, okay, you guys want the money, even though it's not fair. We'll deal with the money chat like a little bit later. We're saying let's let, let's renegotiate how your employment structures are going to be. If you're going to build in Africa, we want you to to hire eighty percent African employees. And your management must be 70%. But then when you give us manage, managerial roles, don't give us the roles that you know do not make sense. Make it a role that we know that you're going to leave us to, cause you're going to give it, you're going to leave us with a skill set that when you, we are done with that whole situation, when you guys can leave, we don't have to ask you guys to help us run the system again. Cause while we were, while we were employed by you in that system at the time, we were learning how to run that thing ourselves. So we, we're learning to teach ourselves to be sovereign in this, in these manufacturing companies that they teach for us. So it's like, don't build and then send your people to come work in here and then make our people work as the labor force only. So it's build. We build with you. One, you're not building for yourself. We build with you because we allow you to build. Two, when you're done building, what we want from you is to, to know that the, the leadership structures and all these businesses that you've built. It must have people that are in training to be able to handle those infrastructures when you guys leave. And when you guys leave is so important because we're saying we don't want you here forever because Africa has to be sovereign in the state. Like, <laughs> honestly, we, we, we don't want to be having Chinese run, uh, services for forever. Now it's, uh, where are we? You know, we need to have African and, and the whole notion of soft power when they built the, the Chinese uh, stuff in 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 Africa. It, I don't feel that it's fair to 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 be subject to having Mandarin on these things that they're building as well. So we can renegotiate that. If you in Kenya, if you if you in Tanzania, and you're gonna build structures, don't put Mandarin. Put our languages there. Don't 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 subconsciously make us learn your language. We don't want to learn your language. Make your people that came here to work here learn our languages instead. If we want to go work in China, we'll learn the Chinese language. And and if that doesn't work for you, then we can't we can't have this this relationship. <laughs> Since you said like the reduction process is very difficult, like what you said, it's once ink is put to paper, it's very it's very hard to to go back from. It. So renegotiation is is we we changing the whole soft power and hard power system so we're saying don't come with your indoctrination also of a chinese system in terms of social system okay the one very interesting thing when you're speaking and saying 
uh, that we are, we will ask China once they finish constructing and they leave, they should leave us. You know, the assumption is that they are looking to leave, but I don't think they are. I think in this whole agenda, like especially when they, when they decide that they want to uh, like start the Confucius Institute, you know, I don't think they are, and the reason why they're using this soft power in teaching their language, I think they're very clear on what they want. They want to integrate even in the culture sense to Africa. So once they finish constructing, for instance, the standard gauge railway in, in Kenya, then they leave and they leave us to manage it. I don't think they are looking to leave. I think they might leave the standard gauge railway for us to run it, but I don't think they are looking to leave. I think they are looking to settle in. I don't know. I think so. That's why they are trying to export their language and such things to us. The the idea of them not leaving, should the African countries at hand not be able to pay back the loans within the given time? What are the alternative methods that we should look at in order to deal with the situation? So, like what you're saying now, right? The only way that, the only reason why I understand them not, why they would be staying for so long is because we've been indebted by these, by these Chinese people and the Chinese like businesses and companies to, to a point where the loans are going to go for the next 50 years to the point where they're going to have, they're going to reintegrate. They're, they're going to be in our society to a state where we, we like, no, this is not. It's not China, it's, it's Africa. So when we do the loan, because every contract can be reassessed. And also, that's why us as African countries, I feel it's important for us to tighten our leadership in terms of us understanding that when we, when we accept this foreign direct investment, we must also understand that how is it easier for a Chinese person to come into Senegal, but then it's, it's hard for a South African to go to Senegal? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's it's like it's like why are we choosing who we want in our borders easier? It's like when I have to apply to go to Europe, I have to get a Schengen visa, I have to get this visa, I have to get that visa, I have to prove that I don't even have COVID nineteen <laughs> before before those do you know what I'm saying? It's like okay, it should be the same process for them. It, people who are not African should have the same level of difficulty to, to live in Africa. And then the preference should be Africa, Africans first, people outside of Africa lost. And by African, we also mean the Africans that are outside of Africa, you know, but just to, just to clear that up. And then, so that, cause that's what's going to help with loan resolution. When we come to think, when we come and have alternative methods saying, no, we don't want you guys here for this long. Not that we don't want you here for this long. We're saying that we can't rule our economic system for, for such a long time. We, we're not permitting this. I agree with what you're saying. Maybe it's because we have a, once you're so indebted to them, you really have no option of saying do not construct a Confucius Institute. You know, like Confucius Institute, the one that they constructed in Tanzania, I think. So Tanzania houses like a really big uh, Confucius Institute. What's happening is that you have debt. You're not able to construct maybe, let's say, like the port. So they construct the port for you and then they ask in exchange when we set up the port, can we also set up something, a cultural center for ourselves here? So I think there's, there are two things which are tied in into that. There's the debt, but then there's also the term of the debt, which is that we are giving part of the African land. Like there's a permanency which we are giving in exchange for the loan that you are getting. You're getting such a permanent trans, almost like it's like a transfer of culture in exchange for a transfer for, of money. So we are getting money and we are giving in exchange because we don't have money. We are giving in exchange such a permanent thing that's going to alter the culture and that's going to alter like, yeah, like the society. We can't pay you. That's what you're saying. So we will take your language in exchange for the money you're giving us. I think there is something in those terms which something which is i think different from what imf and world bank would have done because i think world bank and imf were really looking for money out you know like give you money and maybe have their terms which possibly were not to teach you a language or something even if i think they, they had their own soft power maybe they would establish a military base uh, and maybe the u.s will have military bases in different countries for the money that they gave but it has all, I think it's a trend which 
because we are getting money and what China is asking in exchange is, for instance, I'll construct a building for you, but then I want to house my cultural center there, you know. I think a strategy that we could adopt, which you said, which I completely agree with, is like, for instance, someone who wants to move from uh, Egypt to come to South Africa. I mean, it should be easy, you know. It might help to have uh, that transfer and movement of people within Africa, it might really help solidify the, the economic base to remain within Africa. Like, to my mind, I think Kenya would rather have someone from Tanzania coming to build, uh, I don't know, something in Kenya and, and, you know, like living across border from Tanzania than getting more money and which we are not able to pay and eventually we have to give up, you know, like such a permanent thing, you know. But I agree. But I think for some reason, Africa seems to favor people from outside Africa than Africa itself. I mean, I think we really have to come back and speak, especially about South Africa. It's it's, it's crazy. Getting into yeah, South Africa I, is I, I, it's now I getting have, harder um, than getting into U.S. See, I think that that's where the idea of xenophobia springs from. Like, we need to have a whole xenophobia conversation also on this platform. But I think the borderless, the borderless society is, is, is how we defeat xenophobia because for, what is a phobia? Let's start out there, right? A phobia is the fear, right, of something. So now we, the people in South Africa fear the influx of other people, uh, people from other African countries coming here. Because we haven't been exposed to the idea of having neutral borders. Because we know that you know, the main reasoning that most people have is that, oh, we don't have, um, we, we don't have enough jobs. And then when people come over, they're taking our jobs. So now if we had, if we was able for all African countries to open their borders, and then if there's a high influx of people here, and then we hear, oh, Kenya's booming in terms of infrastructure and they're looking for employment. And there's a lot of people who are unemployed in South Africa. And, and the market is saturated in South Africa. Logically, what are they going to do? They're going to migrate. They're going to, um, yeah, they're going to move. They're going to go <laughs> to Kenya and they're going to go look for the next job opportunity. And then when they're in Kenya, they're going to hear, Oh no, you're too late. It's going down in Burundi. So now what happens is removing the saturation of employment from one area and we're allowing the whole of Africa to be a hub. So, cause now it, it's like gold mining. If, we, if people can hear that. Oh, this is the current hotspot. This is the current hotspot. This is the current hotspot. It forces people to move around the country. And that way we, and what that does, it builds the culture of African people communicating. So now cultures are being, um, was shared. So now we have, we have, we're removing the cultural boundaries. Now you're going to learn about Swahili. You're going to learn about, uh, the Portuguese, uh, languages and, uh, and then the cultures. You're going to go and learn about the Igbo and all, the, you know what I'm saying? It's like when we have borderless, Borderless countries, it removes and it allows for better trade. Imagine now people who have businesses here and it's easier for them to trade with people in, in Central Africa because why we know that African, African people are, are benefited. So what we're saying is the, the, the trade system allows a standard tariff rate for all Africans to move their goods from one country to another country. That allows all of us to move. It encourages trade across Africa at, at, at an alarming rate. And then also it removes the fear of other African people coming to your country or you going to their country. Because right now, Zim is at the, at the brink of reform, I believe, because soon they have to come back. You, you can only stay down for so long. So when the jobs open in Zimbabwe, you're going to find that everyone who's here is going to run, they're going to go back home. And the people that are here, are going to realize that the market here is also so hard. The South Africans that are here are going to realize that the market's so hard that there's actually more jobs in Zimbabwe. But now you, we would have shot ourselves in the foot because we wanted to to hate all the Zimbabweans that come here and everything. So it's like, you see, if we open the borders, everyone can move. Everyone, it's it's You can go to Tanzania. You can go to Burundi. You can go to Malawi. You can go go find a job there. And then obviously, but that, that's also theoretical. So, but that's what I believe. Is going to solve yeah, I, think, I think we should have uh, that conversation. Uh, so, I mean, at some point to just understand really, like, it helps to know, like, mainly the phobia, which you said is like a fear because you're like, uh, you're really trying to protect your jobs. 
But if you knew that you could go work elsewhere, which someone would have to like try and maybe explain a bit, is the fear only about losing jobs? Like if a South African were told, it's fine, let people come work here, but there are jobs in Algeria, would they be willing to move? Because that's the other thing, because I think, I, I don't know, because you see like for instance in Kenya, yeah. like Kenya and Ethiopia, there's a trade agreement of such a kind that a Kenyan can go set up a business in Ethiopia and run it without much difficulty. They have taken out most of the restrictions. Like you can literally go set up a business in, in Ethiopia if you're Kenyan and without much restriction. But do you see many Kenyans going to Ethiopia? I think they are quite, they are not as many, but I think there's quite a bit of movement that has been going on now. But I also think it's a cultural, generational thing so that maybe there are people uh, of the younger generation who would be willing to explore that option much more than people of an older generation who are really who really do not want to explore living elsewhere. Because I think there's coming a generation of people who will not be too keen on living in Kenya, for instance. They can live in Kenya and work in Egypt and go wherever. So I think the mindset, the fear will pass on. But also I think there's a generation that's coming that's, with good education and listening to ideas and really knowing that there are options that exist elsewhere. I think there's a generation that might change the xenophobia thing. I think there might be. Another motivating factor for us, if we want to build the whole narrative of borderless or a borderless Africa and why it would encourage people to move is if we said we had a standard currency, basically. So now a digital currency. So if Africa is one currency, the fear of you saying, oh, I only want to earn rands because rands are stronger than a, a Zim dollar or any other currency that, you know, the currencies themselves divide us. So if we have one currency, it makes you realize that if I go work in, in this country, I'm still getting paid the same. I would, be, I would be getting paid if I was in any other country. So now it's the, now it's, it becomes onto the question of where do you want to? Where are the working opportunities for you? So you don't have the limiting factors of saying, oh, no, the payment is bad in terms of currency. Obviously, payment in terms of what people pay you, that's different. But if we, when we have a digital currency, because the world is moving towards digital currencies, when we have an African digital currency that people can, and that's probably pegged against our natural resources or whatever it is, when we move around the, around the continent as, as Africans, it's easier for us to, to, to pay, I mean, to, to get employment because we know that we don't have the fear of when I send money at home and, and the conversion rate, I work so hard, but then when it gets home, it's $2 or it's one rand or, you know, now it's like, I know that this many Africa I share tokens or, or whatever it is, when it comes to South Africa, it, it, it's the same amount ex- except for the charges. So now it encourages to go work, to work anywhere. And then, yeah. I think that's... I agree. Every word you said. <laughs> yeah, and then, the, and then the next question, but we sort of answered it now, which is the last question. It was loan. Loan suspension is should we find conditions of the loans to be unfavorable? What would the appropriate time frame for these loans to be suspended or reassessed be? And, and then with this one, I was also thinking we, we need to understand that when, we, when we're looking at African countries, we have to also, we can't look at the fact that all African countries have the same history because others have been affected deeper. So if South Africa has a debt uh, that, that's at 100, 100 billion, right, dollars, South Africa can pay that debt back in 50 years. But then if, if we give that same debt to like Malawi, it will take Malawi 100, 150 years to pay back. So now it's like that understanding that the suspension or reduction of these things has to go according to the state of that country too. So it, it has to be a subjective analysis and not and not like a general analysis where we say no, every country does the same thing. It, it, you must we must make it personalized and internalized that this country's situation requires them to have suspension at this rate or and a reassessment that allows for this because we know that it's you can't put the, the standard of what are the, the big three? Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt. They, we can't hold other African countries at those country standards because it's, it's not fair. I agree. And I think this is purely what my observation is. For the economies who are a bit stronger and in, in Africa, you know, like the economies who are a bit stronger and can protect their economy, 
they have a greater bargaining power for even to even renegotiate the loans with China. And that's what I was trying to say, like, especially for the economies which which they are which are struggling, you know, like let's say like Zim or maybe Uganda or yeah. Well, I'm not saying Uganda is struggling, but <laughs> yeah, well, like their currency wise, it's yeah. it's harder for them to to almost fight off any bad terms that you get on the loan. Because you see, you're struggling so much to even build for yourself infrastructure. Whatever comes to you, you take it, you know. If you have no electricity, you are, if you have no electricity connection to your to most of the places, then you take whatever terms that you're given if, if China is offering to connect electricity or internet for you everywhere. But I agree with you, like the cultural differences and the, the situations of each African country are so different that one size does not fit all. Like it's so that now it has to be very customized to your situation. And some cases I think are justifiable. If you're really in need of like the Belt and Road Initiative that for, for China, there are some countries which it's really benefiting, you know, like you see a country like uh, I remember was it Gabon or some some country that it was really struggling for for the electricity. They were really struggling to connect it, and with the Belt and Road Initiative, it's helping with the electricity and that kind of thing. So it's difficult to tell everyone in Africa you should stand strong as a country and never take a loan because <laughs> the situation is so different. But I think the common thing for all African countries, as much as you're in need. Your terms should be reasonable, you know. Like it doesn't mean that because you need your minds should now be, be what you give in exchange for the loan. I mean, I think there should be a level of reason in terms for any country. I think so. Doesn't matter your cultural difference. I think a condition that I was thinking about that we as Africans also need to understand is before any African country goes as far as accepting a loan from China, we, in my fairy tale world, where we actually all help each other, we as African countries should be like, hey, are you sure that that thing that you need help with cannot be aided by us if we worked as a collective first? Because if we do that, then it, we know that you're going to your brothers and sisters for your own help before you go to someone else, somewhere else. It, it, we shouldn't be like, an African country, honestly speaking, shouldn't be subjected to going to someone outside of outside of the continent to get help if we are all willing to, to lend a help to the other African country. Because it's better to be indebted in Africa than to be, you know, outside. We should analyze whether we are able to help each other first before going to ask for help from someone else. I agree, but the, the thing that even I don't quite understand is why are we not able to help each other? Because, <laughs> because I think we can. I think, truly, I think we can. Like, because there's, there's quite a bit of like, if you look like neighboring countries, like if you look within SADAC, if you look within SADAC, I'm sure, like, I, I think South Africa, I'm not sure why South Africa has load shedding because it exports electricity, I think, to neighboring countries. <laughs> Even with the load shedding, <laughs> it does export, I think so. <laughs> they do export, they export to Mozambique and, and some other, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does export electricity, for instance. So, and then when you think like for like the landlocked countries, I think like, uh, like Uganda, for instance, is landlocked and the, normally have to use like uh, to import most of the things like heavy cargo they have to do it either through kenya or tanzania that trade has existed for years like we've we've been able to help out in the fact that they are landlocked you know we are able to help and supply their need we have we have constructed roads that can go directly from mombasa to kampala you know you've constructed roads that can go uh, from Arusha to through Nairobi into Kampala. You know, you, we have found a way of working around each other when it comes to things like the physical situation, difficulty that a country is, is having because we are neighbors. So it's possible for us to help each other. There's a track record of us helping each other. But I think it comes to a point where we everyone becomes selfish and I'm not sure for what reason, but I think it's possible for us to work together. Like there would be no reason why Uganda should be suffering so much when Tanzania is the neighbor nearby with a stronger economy than Uganda, you know? 
Like it makes no sense, you know. It's all the it's, it's the fear that comes from the sanctions that come from the World Bank and the IMF. That's why those two uh, are so important, and we mustn't forget about them. That they are a threat that's still there because they give us. It, it's the fear factor of saying if you guys go help these people, we're going to put san- impose sanctions on you. But now we understand that how are you going to impose sanctions on us when you need our resources? And if every African country was able to stand by that and say you can't impose a sanction on one of our brothers then don't then don't you know what i'm saying it's like we we need to get over the we need we need to we need to first remove the shackles of us being afraid of sanctions first and you know but but you know i've remembered when you said that like there are situations when africa has defied the sanctions like i remember when the international criminal court wanted to prosecute uh, prosecute the people from Kenya, the president, for crimes against humanity. Uh, so that was what happened is that there was such a huge uh, post election violence, and then uh, they they filed case, cases at the ICC, and ICC wanted to prosecute now the current president and and his deputy. And do you know Africa Union voted against? Uh, like they literally almost voted against to get out of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Like Africa Union defied the president was not uh, was not prosecuted. So and I think th- that was a situation. And and I remember like there were countries, there were presidents of certain countries who stood up and said no. Like there's no way we are letting someone go prosecute an African leader in an international court. For things that have happened in Africa. So we, as Africa, we will prosecute. Eventually wasn't prosecuted anyway, but that was a situation. You should keep yeah. that same, that same energy and, and, and that same protection for one another. Because you know what I'm saying? It has to be that way. But the thing is also, we also need to understand that aid is a factor. Aid is a factor. I think, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. China took their, their blueprint from Tokyo, right? Well, I mean, Japan, right? In yeah. terms of their, it, it, you see what I'm saying? We we can also take the blueprint from them and apply it for ourselves. It, it, it shows you that just we, we just need to adaptability, adapt, adapt. And the aid comes, but we're saying that aid should not be aid that cripples any of us because we know we're tired of being crippled when we know that they everyone needs us, but we're the ones who who are fighting each other or, or restricting each other. It shouldn't be that way, is, is what I believe. We should, like what you said, stand. And then the African Union actually needs to become an African Union that's present. And people know that there's an African Union. It should be everywhere. And, and known that don't mess with the African Union, you know? Yeah. Because, like, I only took the African Union serious once I was in Boston because I was like, but then I knew there was a European Union from high school. Mm-hmm. You see, that's how important presence is. We, we need to have a presence in terms of our advertising of African of African things and, and the African public and the African political systems, economic systems. We need to the media needs to stop putting these things out there. And then us from seeing that, we need to understand how powerful those systems are in themselves. Yeah, I completely agree. One one really amazing thing I found out the other day is that the East African community, what, what they've been doing is that Kids who are right now in like really, I don't know, grade four or five are being taught the East African community and them, the East African community values, the East African community. I was shocked. Like there's an, there's an East African community and them, which kids now mm. see, <laughs> which I've never heard of. And <laughs> all African countries should all have, it should be a requirement that we all learn, let's say Swahili or uh, what was the other language, Katie? Oh. Swahili or Lingala or you know what I'm saying? I don't know if that's Swahili. Because now we know if I go from point A to point from here to Morocco, I know that I'm gonna speak Swahili and I'll be understood. The same way in China we all speak um Mandarin or I obviously there's different dialects, I don't know, but we should have we should have two or three because I know that Africa is vast, so we have like the east, the west. So we should have two or three and those are taught, but Swahili for me, is the most important. So we walk around knowing that I don't get lost when I'm in uh, Sudan or, you know, the, the, the communication, like what you're saying, then from there, it spreads the culture of being African better. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, I, th- I agree. Like, such small cultural differences. Because why would we be learning learning a language from the Confucius Institute, but we can't learn Swahili? You know, because 
if if China is able to uh, like transfer its language and people like kids possibly will be learning Mandarin as a language, like why can't they learn Swahili or why can't they learn like Lingala or a different language, you know, like why can't they not? And what you're using is the blueprint of China. The blueprint they are using is to bring their culture and their language to us. Why can't we have like an African language, borrow the same blueprint and have us also strongly, you know, like strongly building the, a common language, a common currency, a common, it just psychologically helps. Uh, you know, I think it's quite wise that the East African community decided to be teaching its national, its East African anthem to kids. Because a child mm. who is growing up right now, my nephew who is like maybe eight years, was telling me details about the East Africa community. And I, so I was like, why? Why do you know them? Then he told me that they are taught in school right now and he needs to like know the anthem of East Africa. So to his mind, he's growing up knowing not just about Kenya, but he's knowing... uh that Burundi is a country where, you know, it is a country where, which is common to me. So in his mind, he doesn't have Kenya in his mind. He has the East Africa, six countries to his mind at what he looks Many, at as his, from, you know. From, and, and if a kid were to ask, why, why Swahili? We can say to him, no, did you know about Bantu languages? Did you know about Nguni languages? Then now, now you're building the culture because the kid will be like, whoa, what, what is that? What is, so now it's like, oh, Bantu languages actually range from this, Kosa, Siswati, Zulu, Swahili, Lingala, all of When I say Nalingi, you must know I'm saying what I'm saying. I think I love you, right? If I'm saying Minataka Wewe, you must know I'm saying, if I'm saying Asante, I'm saying thank you. All of these things, we must understand what it is to be a Bantu speaking person, you know? Because language is, is how you spread culture, in my understanding. Like, because yeah. if, if, if you can get a person from a young age to be interested in being being bilingual or, or learning more about languages instead of learning about foreign languages, like or like English or anything like that, and you teach them. But yeah, that's what I'll say. That's it. But also, we had this is recorded. Yeah. I, I'm gonna say my goodbye, and I'm gonna say to the Africans who are gonna hear this. Mina <laughs> That that Swahili is wrong, but <laughs> oh, <not> again. <laughs> that Swahili is wrong. <laughs> and I was so confident. But you see, when you try, now I can go learn. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go learn and then next time I'm gonna say it properly when we have the conversation again. <laughs> what is the right word? That Swahili is so wrong. I I yeah, I, I don't know where to start correcting it. <laughs> it's a, like, like, I will have to edit out. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but the confidence with which you said it. <laughs> Someone who speaks Swahili, just go say those words to them. <laughs> <sighs> I'm gonna go ask them. Actually, and then I'm gonna next time when, when are we we should have the the second the part two, and then I'm gonna say I'm gonna give a I'm gonna actually give a, a closing message in Swahili. Okay, cool. We will when we do that next time when we have this China uh, conversation uh, next time we will agree on when to have it next, and then yeah.